My first question was, what was your impression about the first global HR forum? Yes, as you mentioned, it said some, some things, but they may. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, I thought the the forum is uh, is terrific as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. I've, uh, mm -hmm. I haven't had a chance to attend all the sessions, mm -hmm. obviously, but the ones I've been to, I thought the speakers were first rate. Yes. Um, they were also came from a wide variety of um, backgrounds. Yes. You had some from academics, you had some from uh, business, you have yeah. some from government, and they also came from a lot of different countries. So I think you're getting a real idea of um, a lot of different views on how to create global mm -hmm. talent, and yeah. uh, it's very helpful. Mm -hmm. well, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I will shut down. So have you, uh, did you have many chances to communicate with other participants? Of this mm -hmm. HR forum, yeah. yes, I've had a, I've had a, a number of chances to uh, to meet with them at uh, either uh, a lunch or uh, breakfast, mm -hmm. and then uh, obviously in the sessions. So uh, it's been uh, that that's been very helpful, and uh, mm -hmm. some of the people are, uh, are are new, and some are old friends, and it's yeah. a good chance to get for example who, who was your old friend? Well. Um, J.P. Obeda, yes. who was one of the speakers who's from Ayala in yeah. uh, the yeah. Philippines. Yeah. Uh, J.P. and I have been colleagues for 20 years. Yeah. 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 So we caught up. Yeah. Uh, Jean-Christophe Histoll, yeah. so who was uh, from the uh, People's Republic of China, China. who um, uh, spoke uh, this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, he and I have known each other for uh, a couple of years. Yeah. So, chance to. And the you, 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 you heard and you met several different speakers. So yes. you, among them, what, 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 kind, what, what speech was most impressive to you? And as uh, was interesting. Oh, I don't know. I thought uh, I, I, I you thought a lot of them. And, uh, uh, yeah. I, I thought a lot of them were very good. Um, I thought the. Um, the the speech this morning by. Um, and then Gary McLean, I think, um, who spoke about core competencies mm -hmm. and yeah. some of the problems, some of the uh, you know uh, attractions about them, but then some of the problems. I thought that was a uh, a very good analysis mm -hmm. of, of some of the issues around core competencies. Mm -hmm. uh, I liked. Um, I, I just came from the global demographic session. Yes, I yes. thought everything was uh, the, all, all the speakers. Did you say good? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, the one that uh, Chu and Lee was moderating. Yes. Yeah. Yesterday there was an uh, aging related uh, speech, especially by Fukuyama. How? Oh yes, uh, I thought. Oh, uh, he's he's brilliant, um, and uh, yeah. I, uh, I I could listen to him all day. Yeah. And uh, he, I, I thought his uh, introduction to the forum was just terrific. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Especially what, what what was um, what was his message about aging? Problem. Well, I think he was identifying some of the uh, aging issues and, and putting them in the context of, uh, of globalization and uh, issues around global talent. But mm -hmm. um, I think um, um, he, he had some statistics that I hadn't seen before mm -hmm. and uh, some different ways of thinking of it. Yeah, this is HR forum, and we are saying global HR, global talent. Yes. But uh, would you explain why global, not local or Korean mm -hmm. talent? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's um, it, it's an it's an interesting issue. I think um, it, it I think it's related to in some ways to the aging phenomenon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because what what aging what the aging phenomenon is saying is a lot of the well actually pretty much all of the developed countries now are going to be seeing their workforces shrink. Mm -hmm. So companies that are successful, that are in countries like um, like, like South Korea, Japan, mm -hmm. uh, the UK, the US, they're not going to be seeing the same increases in the workforce. So if they want to continue to grow and to, and to, and to, and to prosper, they're going to have to be in other locations around the world. Yeah. So we've already seen the rise of, of, com of uh, companies that have already been globally, but it's become, become even more of an imperative for them in the future. Yeah. When you're doing that, you don't want 
one of the problems that you have if you're trying to run a global company is if you have people that only know about the local way of doing things, mm -hmm. then you can't move them around. You can't necessarily provide career paths for them in the organization. Beyond that, as a, as a, as a company, you don't prosper as much as you could have because if you do things right, you can learn from the ways of doing things that are invented mm -hmm. in, other, um, in other locations. Uh, as an example for us at Watson Wyatt, one of the things that uh, we've been very successful with is just uh, thinking strategically about human resources. Mm -hmm. And this is a process that was developed by our Japanese colleagues. Mm -hmm. And then our Japanese colleagues shared it and introduced it into the Philippines and uh, South Korea, mm -hmm. and then from there we introduced it to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. But by having done that, that gives us a competitive advantage all around the world. Yeah. And if you don't do that, one of your competitors will. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be a company that's going to compete, not just today, but in the world of the future, mm -hmm. you have to be able to access these kind of global talent pools. Yeah, so mm -hmm. there are many countries uh, who import talents from other countries and who export their talents to, yes. to de developed countries. So, but th th how do you see the Korean potential? We can be the export countries or import countries in terms of talent? I the talent level is uh, white color and blue color, including all, 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 all mm. levels. Okay. Yes. Um, well, you may want to join in on this, GS, but uh, I'll. Uh, uh, from my viewpoint, um, South Korea is has one of the most highly educated populaces in the yes. world. Um, uh, you know, they, they were quoting earlier today the percentage of people that go into secondary and then tertiary education. And uh, mm -hmm. um, at, from that viewpoint, um, then Koreans are able to provide um, leaders for around the world. Mm -hmm. By the same token, I don't think any country is going to be the simply an exporter or simply an importer. I yes, think you're going to be right, seeing that these countries that are going to be successful are going to be having their people go away and learn and lead and do that and then come back and join them. Um, J. Pierre Beta in his session was uh, talking about this from a, an interesting angle. Um, Ayala found that a lot of their, they have a construction company mm. and a lot of their um, construction engineers were leaving them and going to Dubai because there were a lot of opportunities yes. there. So what JP and Ayala did was they actually set up a program and said to people, come work for us and we'll send you to Dubai to these opportunities for two or three years. You just agree to come back and work for us after you've done it. So what happened is they now became attractive to a lot of people that they wouldn't normally have done. The people were probably going to go work in Dubai anyway, but mm -hmm. now they've agreed to come back and work for you all with some yeah. experience that's very valuable. I think that's the kind of thing we need mm -hmm. to think about when we're doing global talent. Did they established another company for doing... No, they just established a special mm -hmm. program. Yeah. And they said to people, you come and join us and then we'll, uh, we'll arrange for you to do that. And they made arrangements with the construction companies in mm -hmm. Dubai. So do, do, you, uh, do you, I mean, you, Watson Wyatt has that kind of program? Well, we don't have that kind of program ourselves because we... Um, we actually have operations in all the places that are important around the world. Mm -hmm. But we do have people, um, we, we move our people around. Let me give you an example of somebody yeah. just, from, um, just from here. Truly Lee, uh, who is a Korean national, yes. mm -hmm. she uh, joined us in Hong Kong in around 1990 or so. Mm -hmm. Worked yes. there for a few years. Then she came to Seoul and she started a Korean operation here yeah. in South Korea. She did that for a number of years. Then she went to New York mm -hmm. and did consulting to multinational companies in New York. And then I asked her to come back to Asia Pacific and head the whole region. And yeah. she's now based in Hong Kong again. Mm -hmm. So that, I think, is the model for what we want to do more of mm -hmm. in the future. Mm -hmm. So it, uh, it, is on, it is new opportunity for talent themselves, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. But because the Korean culture is some, something like conservative, we are afraid of losing our talents to other countries. But mm -hmm. still, we are short of some blue colors. Mm -hmm. So we need to import 
Philippines, the, from the people from Philippines or Bangladesh or some, some countries like that. But, so what can be your advi advice to Korean? Cultural respect or, uh, yes, yeah. yes, legal respect, okay. maybe. I would say uh, uh, a few things. One, not to be afraid of it. Mm. I mean, globalization has, um, globalization and global movement of workers is something that in the long run is good for everybody. Yes. Um, and I think what governments need to do is to understand that there are sometimes dislocations. People come in or, or operations get outsourced and it affects some workers. Mm. Instead of trying to stop that, what governments should do is assist the workers who are hurt by that. Mm. And because everybody will be better off if it works and they can use some of the, uh, um, um, you know, some of the gains from um, outsourcing or globalization or things like that can be used to assist workers to move into more competitive areas, then I think, again, that, that helps everyone. Um, I think um, from, the, from the viewpoint of uh, regulations, I think uh, one of the things that uh, governments can do is to introduce more labor market flexibility. Yes. Because sometimes one of the reasons that people go to other places or look to other workers is because there's uh, labor market rigidities in their own country. Mm -hmm. you, know, you hire somebody, it's, there's very high payroll taxes, you can't fire them. I had an interesting, um, mm -hmm. I was in Beijing last, uh, last December and mm -hmm. at a conference and there was a, um, an individual who was uh, a uh, one of the relatively rare investment uh, people from China and he had these he was looking at locating his operations around the world and places. And one of the things he talked about was the um, unattractiveness of Germany from his perspective. Mm. Because they had very high payroll taxes and they were probably going to get higher. If he, uh, if he hired workers, he couldn't fire them and yeah. he had all these problems. And he said, this great phrase, he said, when you can't fire workers, you fire a country. Mm. So we're not going to be in Germany. Mm. <laughs> and well, those are some things I think for governments yeah. to think about. They want to be more competitive. Maybe this very important terminology. You can fire employees. Well, it's it, it's uh, what, what he meant was it's so in in some of these countries it's so expensive mm. that you can't do it. So what you do is you just sort of fire the country. You say, yeah. okay, I'm not going to be there. Yeah, I'm not going to have migrations. And I think that's a significant issue for. Um, a number of the European economies right now. Yeah. And it's one of the reasons why I think they have yeah. some issues around potentially losing um, operations to places like Mexico. Yeah. I mean, we work with clients who are looking at putting operations in Mexico that used to be in some of the European economies mm -hmm. for some of those reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm worried about uh, our country's uh, status right now because I don't think it's only for the German case. Korean, uh, Korean in, in, in country base, I, I mean, is also infamous for the rigid labor force right. and strikes. And in fact, that's why I mentioned yeah. that, because GS has told me about mm. uh, some of the um, labor market rigidities in, uh, in, in South Korea. And I think, uh, from your viewpoint, that's a big concern here, too. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. Another, another, another aspect uh, it is uh, regulation related, another one is a cultural aspect. Mm. So Koreans should be more, more open, open, more open to different, uh, different culture and different yeah. people. So in, in the current, in the, in the soon future there is uh, some shortage in the worker anyway, higher level, sure level, yeah. level, uh, low level. So we should be accept the diversity or difference. Yes, in diversity. The global, yes, in the global situation. Yeah, as GS mentioned, uh, the the potential or the the essence of the global talent. I mean, they they should be fluent in in foreign languages and yes. and open to diversities. And what can you you can add some essential characteristics? Yeah. Of yeah. I would say a couple of things. One is you, um, you, you, you do need to be um, 
fluent in other languages mm -hmm. and in, uh, in doing that. Now, uh, as an example, in my own case, I'm too old to learn new languages, no. but, uh, but my uh, younger daughter, when she started school, I put her in a school that was a Chinese immersion. Yeah. So she's uh, 15 now, and she spent uh, nine years in school learning Chinese, so she mm -hmm. speaks Mandarin, and she can do that. And I think that's what uh, the, the workers of the future are going to be the ones who have that ability to, mm -hmm. uh, to speak more than one language. I think, uh, in particular, English is really the language of business, mm -hmm. and it's important, uh, it, it's important for people to, uh, to do that. Um, I think one of the things that is most important for being a good global worker, there was a, um, somebody uh, at one of the sessions talked about what they were looking for, well, I think it was the guy from Boeing, he said what they were looking for is for people to solve problems mm -hmm. that hadn't yet come up with uh, scientific discoveries that hadn't yet occurred mm -hmm. and you know, using knowledge that hadn't yeah. yet been thought of. And I think that's right. One of the problems that a lot of companies have right now is they tend to hire people for certain specific technical skills. Mm -hmm. yes. And in fact, the people who are going to be most successful in a dynamic global one are not people who focus in on the way things are done before, but they're people who have, have learned the skills to solve problems. Yes. And as that's something that we have to look for in our company, and I think for all companies, we want people who are flexible. Mm -hmm. We want people who don't come in with the um, necessarily thinking they know all the ways to solve things, mm -hmm. but uh, mm -hmm. who have that ability to, to learn and adapt to problems. Because the one thing I'm sure of is that the problems that um, the you know, next generation is going to face are in large part would be ones that we haven't even conceived of yet. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. And so that's, that's what we're looking for. That's particularly important when you're thinking about a global organization though because as you, we, we talked about diversity, as you have people move to different cultures, they have to be alive to understand what they're getting out of them to say, okay, I can take this and how do I apply this to what I already know mm -hmm. and come up with something that's different. So we need people that are open-minded, I guess, yeah. is a way of thinking Open-minded and uh, ha have some characteristics of the problem solver. Yes. Okay. Um, it is not easy to be born, to be born creative, born flexible. So the companies has, has to have to develop the potential yes. of the employees. But I think that's right. And uh, in fact, uh, we've just been through a um, uh, study ourselves to look at Watson Wyatt. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we said was um, we talk to our clients all the time about career and leadership development, mm -hmm. but we're not doing it enough ourselves. Yeah. And so we have a, um, a long-term project that we've been working on and, uh, right now to build up our career and leadership development. Mm -hmm. And we've engaged some uh, um, people to help us with this. Mm -hmm. And we are starting rolling this out uh, later this month. Yeah. I'm taking the top management committee in um, Watson Wyatt, and we're going to go away for an off-site to work with the leadership mm -hmm. development firm. We're going to test it all out on ourselves, and then we're going to introduce it to the rest of the organization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When, when we are using, when we using the, the terminology of career development or something like that, we tend to, I mean, Korean tend to think it is uh, something like mobility from this company to other companies. Uh, yeah. And that's, that's part of it, but what we're thinking about too is we're saying um, we need to define what are the characteristics of a leader at Watson Wyatt. Mm. What do we want out of people who are going to be our leaders? And then we want to go out to our people and say, this is what we're looking for, this is how you can um, advance in the organization, yeah. and this is, these are some of the characteristics we want you to get. And it could be experiences, mm -hmm. working, but it could also be leadership skills, yeah. being able to deal with certain uh, issues or yeah. activities. Uh, it, it is not easy for me to understand because the, the human resource professionals like Watson Wyatt have not 
doing that kind of program for their own readers. Leaders, right? Yeah, we're not. So we're that's why we. But we decided we need to do that mm. in the future. So, for example, um, you know, if you look at it, uh, the, um, the 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 fellow from Boeing who yeah. was speaking today was saying that Boeing has this uh, learning institute where mm -hmm. they send the people and they have all these professors that come in and all these ones who teach them. They're probably not teaching them how to make a plane. No. They're teaching them how to manage people, they're teaching them what uh, the skills they want. That's what we're working on Yeah. for ourselves. Yeah, I understand, but, it, but st still <coughs> some companies ha has not, have not, have not that kind of program to develop their own employees' leadership or something. So that's why the, we did uh, some pro professional co uh, service companies like Watson Wire. Yes, that's correct. Uh, the problem of, uh, I think, the, the problem is the workers' su supply surplus in Korea. Because we need to, we need to develop our uh, work, uh, employees' potential part, we have so many, so many candidates to, to come to my company. So we can easily change the mm -hmm. old ones to new ones. So mm -hmm. I, I don't think they have, I, I mean the companies or bosses or CEOs have some motivation to develop, mm -hmm. especially global talent development. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah. It, it's, uh, by the way, I, I think it's a very, um, it, 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 it's a very interesting question, and um, I remember several years ago I was talking to a very big multinational, and um, they had um, they they had a number of engineers that um, had been trained, and they were they were trained in sort of uh, the analog way of yeah. Thinking. And they said, this is a digital world and we need, to, we need to think. And they brought them back and they did a lot of training. Mm -hmm. And they found that they could train the people and they understood the techniques and everything. And you know, they were able to test them and they, they understood everything. But then when they sent them back out to work, they reverted back to the old way of doing things. Mm -hmm. So they could teach them new things, but they couldn't. They, 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 it was so ingrained in their way of doing it that they mm -hmm. couldn't do it. And this gets to the issue of flexibility. Mm -hmm. One of the things in the past is people learned things and then they just did them the same way all the time. And you know, even if you get the knowledge, you can't necessarily apply it. It's mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a habit mm -hmm. as to how you do it. Mm -hmm. And this is something that, as a business leader, you have to think about how you're going to trade that off. Yeah. Because, you know, for this company, it didn't matter that they had all this talent. They couldn't use it. Mm -hmm. So they had to actually get new people in to do that. Yeah. You said that the, it, the developed countries are feel short of some yes. talent because of the, the aging population. In the same future. Yeah. Is there any possibility to educate or to 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 develop their their own uh, talent from the aging yes aging aging yeah population? well I think the, the the way to deal with the with the shrinking workforce as a result of the aging there's 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 several things you can do one is you can bring more women into the workforce mm -hmm. because traditionally. Um, there haven't been as many, but it's very interesting. If I take a look at the United States, mm -hmm. let me just draw a picture here. Um, uh, let me just get my pen here. No, uh, exactly. If I take a look at the United States back in 1950, let's say, and I look at the um, this is the um, labor force participation rate. Mm. So the, the percentage of people in the workforce. Yes. And I look at it from age 20 up to about age 60 or so. Mm. And for men, it would look something like you know that. Mm. Yeah. And for women, it looks something like that. Yeah. It was in 19... This is in 1950. Yeah. Uh, men... 1950 women. 
And if I look at it in 2000, it's about the, uh, it's about the same. Mm -hmm. 2000 women or something like that. So what's happened is, this is the United States. Yes. There's very little chance to bring more women in. But if I look at, say, Italy today, mm -hmm. even in 2000, the 2000 men are something like this. Up to 2000 women are way down here. Still. So some countries have an opportunity to do it, some countries don't. If I look at the Scandinavian countries, they look more like the U.S. Their labor yeah. force participation rate of women is almost identical to men. Mm. They're always going to be a little bit lower, uh, just because as women have children, they're out of the workforce and things like that. But still, um, it's uh, very close. Italy and Spain, very big gap. So you yeah. can do that. You can bring more, more women into the workforce. Uh, the labor force participation rate of women in Japan mm. is much lower. So there's some opportunities to bring more women into the workforce. There is one way. Yeah. Yeah. That's, so that's one way to do it. What is your explanation of the, the kind of result of Italy or Japan? Why they? Part of it is uh, part of it is cultural. Mm -hmm. um, yes. It's just a matter of uh, mm -hmm. of their notions of uh, you know what women should be doing, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. it's uh, you know in in Scandinavia it's very clear that they had a different cultural idea. Yeah. And uh, women have just been in the workforce for a much longer time. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I think this is changing in some places. Yeah. The yeah. interesting thing to me, by the way, is that. Uh, Italy has a very low labor force participation rate of women, mm. but it also has one of the lowest fertility rates in the world. Mm. So women aren't necessarily they're working, but they're not necessarily having children either. So mm. it's, so uh, it's what, a little bit of a puzzle. They, what are they doing? Well, it's, mm. uh, it's interesting. Italy has some very uh, funny other characteristics. Uh, the, the average Italian man lives with his family until he's age 32. So he, 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 he do not marry? Not mm. typically. That's the average age at which they leave. So uh, you're not having too many children then, I guess. Um, so yeah. there's, there, this is why some of these are cultural issues that yeah. are tied up. But one of the issues with Italy is there's higher unemployment among young people because payroll taxes are so high. Uh, mm -hmm. So companies don't hire workers. Mm -hmm. But of course, one of the reasons payroll taxes are high is because they don't have enough workers to spread it over. So, so. <laughs> that's, <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, that's one, that's one, one way of is, doing it. Yeah. Another way of doing it is um, to get people to work longer. Yes. Yeah. Um, but if I look at um, retirement patterns in the United States, the percentage of people working, say, after the age of 60. Mm -hmm. And we have information that goes back to the Civil War in the United States, so in 1865. From 1865 to today, the percentage of people working after age 60 has gone down year after year after year after year. Mm -hmm. So when something is the same for 150 years, I tend to consider that a bit of a trend. So people probably don't want to work. You know, They probably prefer mm -hmm. to be retired and to work, and so we're fighting against that. Having generous social security systems makes it easier for people to retire also. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the issues that we have to face. I think that um, I think that the developed countries around the world are going to have to rethink about when social security benefits start. Mm -hmm. In the United States, we started social security benefits in, when we introduced it in 1935, we had a retirement age of 65. 1935 is when we started it. Yeah. 65 was the retirement age that we set mm. for Social Security. But at that stage, most you know, most of your workers probably didn't live to 65 yeah. anyway, and even those that did would only live for five or seven years. Yes. Now we still have. Uh, now we have a, a retirement age of uh, just over 65, but. When somebody gets to age 65, they're probably going to live for about another 18 years. Mm -hmm. So it's a very different um, whole deal that we have now mm -hmm. than we had back in 1935. Mm -hmm. And there's a similar thing for other countries around the yes. world. Mm -hmm. So we need to think about that. If we can get people to work longer, not only do we have to pay them, last time, but they also contribute to the economy markets. Yes. Yes. Now that's different in some countries than others. In 
South Korea, in Japan, in the United States, in the, the European Union countries, it's you can ask people to work longer and they have the jobs that you can do it. Mm. China, you have a lot of jobs that are much more physically demanding. Yes. So it's not so easy for China to get people to work longer mm. because there's a much higher rate of disability mm. among older people. I remember some numbers about Korea. 54, 68, 77. It was 20 in 2005. We retired from the average ages of retiring from first of our main company and 68 is retiring and uh, the being active, active of the workforce so they cannot earn money mm -hmm. and 77 is the lifetime ex expectancy so still uh, it goes to down to 50 or we need to educate aged people yes. to work longer but right. absolutely but the, the problem is the workforce supply is still a surplus so so many mm -hmm. men and women to find it mm -hmm. well, the issue is it's in, it might be a surplus mm -hmm. now but it won't but that's why the declining workforce is an issue because yes, it won't be a yes. surplus mm -hmm. forever the other thing by the way that you could think about is immigration uh, immigration yeah. Yes, immigrants. If you can get more immigrants coming in, then you increase your workforce that way. Yeah. And that's particularly important for countries like um, uh, some of the European countries. Mm. Um, because they'll see. Right now, as, as of the 2000, the number of uh, workers between, say, 20 and 65 mm. in. Um, Germany and in Mexico, mm. almost identical. Both had about 50 million, a workforce of about 50 million. Yeah. Over the first three decades of this century, um, Mexico is going to go from 50 to about 80 million. Germany is going to go from 50 to about 40. Mm. So two countries which had roughly similar workforces, mm. now one of them is going to be twice as large as the other. Yes, yes. So it's going to be a big difference in terms of relative economic output. Mm. I cannot remember the exact numbers, but we need, we need to import many the blue colors from other countries, especially Asian countries. But uh, I think we need to also need to import some some the white colors yes. from Asia or some from other countries. How can you see some barriers? Mm -hmm. for us to import that kind of talent. Well, okay. I think, I think a, a, a very big barrier is the issue of um, how accepting a country and a culture are to uh, immigration. Um, some countries are just, uh, just more open. I mean, mm -hmm. in the U.S., we have, um, for a long time, we've had people from yes, all yes. different uh, countries that have come there. Uh, J.P. Beta was showing um, the number of uh, what he called OFWs, Overseas Filipino mm -hmm. Workers. O-F-W. OFW, I had never seen it. Overseas <laughs> Filipino <laughs> Workers. So at least I think that's what it meant. But anyway, it was, uh, there were, he thought there were about uh, 8 million around the world. Mm -hmm. yes. Three and a quarter million were in the U.S. Mm -hmm. In fact, there were as many in the U.S. as there were in all of Asia. And when you think about how that's a lot, a lot further to travel. In fact, there were there were 3.28 million in in the U.S. and I think it was 0.77 mm. in all of Europe. So that just gives you an idea about how open some mm. uh, uh, countries are to that. I think, um, and what 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 countries ought to be doing is to be saying. In the immigration, we're looking to attract people that bring in special skills, mm -hmm. special talents, special business know-how, um, people who are going to be entrepreneurial and develop it. Uh, my older daughter is in college, and she spent a semester at, um, in Australia uh, um, earlier this year, mm -hmm. and from um, and she was at the University of New South Wales. 
And while she was there, she got a email from the Australian Embassy, and it said, oh, you're here studying in Australia. Would you like to come back and uh, study at graduate school or law school in Australia? Because if you do, we'll offer you Australian citizenship. Mm. And so what they were doing is saying, if you come back and are pursuing advanced degrees here, we want, that's the kind of person we want to get. And it's actually pretty hard to get Australian citizenship in some cases. You have to be there for a while, but here they're trying to use it to attract people. Mm. This is the kind of thinking I think governments need yes, to do. That kind of openness is not easy for the particular companies or the individuals to. So what can be the role or of what can be the role of the government for develop the, develop the global economy? Yeah. Well, I think um, the government has a role probably in educating mm. the populace about the importance of that. Um, they have a role in developing policies to attract the right kind of um, people because it's it's important to get, I'm not saying it's not important to get blue collar workers from mm. overseas, obviously that is. But it's also important to get the right kind of talent and to be bringing in. Otherwise, you end up in a position where if you're just, if you only export talent and you don't import, you're a net loser mm. in, the, uh, in, in the global competitiveness game. And so I think it's important for not just the government and not just business, it's also important for the whole population to understand that this, this helps everybody mm -hmm. and that this is what you need to do. But that's a longer term issue. Yeah. Those things don't change overnight. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many parties that accept government, but we have universities or companies and public organizations. That can, can you explain the, the role of development month of global talent. Yeah, I, I think um, global, one of the um, interesting things that I, I get a chance to see is the extraordinary collection of um, top universities that there are all around the world. Mm -hmm. um, you um, I think the U.S. educational system is very good. I think yeah. the U.S. university system is very good. But um, there are a lot of good universities. I mean, we, uh, you know, we, we heard a presentation about Korea University. You've got the National University. You've got Yonsei. Um, there are a lot of world-class um, um, universities that we have here in this country. and. Um, I, I think when you look at what those universities are doing, they're probably in the forefront of, um, of developing these kind of uh, um, uh, global talent pools. I do think one of the things you need to be careful of, though, is again, it's getting overly technical education at the expense of educating people to solve problems. Mm. So that's one thing I would... Overly uh, technical? Yes, in other words, it's um, it's it's... Education for and then when I say overly technical, I mean just too much how to do things a certain way, as opposed to educating people to uh, think about things creatively and give them opportunities to, uh, to to work on that. Yeah, can I understand that way? Uh, we need to de most developing countries tend to want to develop some engineers, right. not the humanitarians or something like that. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and engineering is a real good example because it goes back to that example I was giving of the multinational. Yeah. They got analog engineers and as long as, there was, as, long as it was an analog world, mm -hmm. they could do exactly what they wanted. Yes. But when the world changed, they needed new people and they couldn't educate the ones they, they couldn't re-educate the ones they already have. Mm -hmm. so, Global organizations that have people who are more flexible, who can relearn new things as the times change, that's what's going to be. Yeah. Regarding creativity or the flexibility, uh, I graduated, I majored in philosophy in my college. Ah, okay. But the companies do not like the people yeah. mm -hmm. with this kind of background. Yeah, I know. Uh, I think companies are short-sighted about that. I don't yeah. think that's the right thing, but it's, uh, yeah. What is your major? 
I major in mathematics. mathematics. <laughs> yeah. but, I, but the mathematics I major in is of absolutely no use to business. Mm, no. So um, it was almost like majoring in philosophy. Yeah. yeah can you explain that you, you are, I mean, the Russian wise policy to recruit uh, global talent? Yeah. I mean, for, for example, the Chuli Lee or J.S. Kim. What, what was your um, criteria? We're looking for um, we're looking for people who are really smart. Mm. We're people who are really smart. We want people who um, are open-minded. Mm, yeah. We want people who um, I might refer to them as global citizens. Mm. In other words, they they see beyond any particular country or any particular way of doing it and can understand that. Yeah. We also know people though who understand the local market. Yeah. You know, so we're trying to combine both of those together. Um, we are also looking for people who are very much team players. Mm. Um, I think that that is one of the most important things we can do. Mm. In fact, in in the past, sometimes I used to tell people, we would look and we would measure how smart somebody is to little differences as to pick yes. who we wanted to hire. And yet that wasn't the most important thing. The most important thing was how can we get people who are not just smart at a certain level, but also work together, mm -hmm. create good working teams. Let me give you an example of this from the world of sport. Um, we have the um, American basketball teams that we've had. NBA. Yeah. Well, they're not just the players from the NBA that we've sent to the Olympic Games or to the World Games or anything. And those players are great individual athletes. Yes. Absolutely terrific individual athletes. But they're not a great team. Mm. Um, you know, at the Olympics, I think when they finish sixth. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of talent, a lot of talent but not a team. No. Success for some of them was having a really good game. Mm. Success for some of the other countries was winning. Mm. And so what we need to do is to find, and we're, we try to apply the same principles at Watson Wyatt. Yeah. We want people who are going to work together as a team. We want people who are going to win in the world. We're not looking for people who are necessarily individual stars themselves. No. I mean, you have to, like in basketball, you have to have a certain level of talent to compete, yeah. mm -hmm. and we need to have that. Mm -hmm. But those are the kind of things we look for. Yeah, so he's open-minded and smart. <laughs> <laughs> and a team player. <laughs> Does this sound like the one you know? Yes. yes. <laughs> uh, when we say global talent, some individuals want to be global talent someday. I mean, young, young university students. Mm -hmm. What can be your advice for them to develop themselves to be future global talent? Let me tell you the single mm. biggest regret in my career. Mm. I never worked in another country. Mm. I never, mm. I did mm. I travel to a lot of different countries now, but I wish that uh, 20 years ago. Yes. But see, 20 years ago, with my organization, there wasn't the opportunity to move around and to do that. But nowadays, people coming in mm -hmm. can find opportunities to do it. And obviously, not everybody's going to go and work somewhere else, but it's something that everybody should think about and should yeah. consider. And if you can't actually go and work somewhere else, you ought to at least be, you ought to at least be looking to work with other people in your organization mm -hmm. cross-border mm. on projects, on problems, so that you get an understanding of that. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, that, that's the best advice I could give somebody. The other thing I would say is um, when you're looking for organizations, look for organizations that are, offer you the opportunity to learn. I have a... Um, I have a daughter, as I mentioned, who's a senior in college, and mm -hmm. she's out there thinking about, uh, you know, what company she should go apply to or to look mm -hmm. for. I keep on telling her the first thing to ask about is what kind of training programs they have mm -hmm. and how they're going to help you and how they're going to move your head. So she's in, in Australia, right? Well, she's uh, she came back from Australia. She's now back for her senior year in the U.S. Yeah. So. Maybe this is an extra question, but uh, most most. 
especially Korean people, tend to understand consultants are moving rapidly to other companies. But in mm -hmm. your case, it is, it is just your second, second company for your life, right? Yes. Um, you know what? I, um, I got into the company, and I didn't expect to stay there necessarily a really mm -hmm. long time. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't even know what it would be like, but I just thought, well, I'll try it and see how it works out. Turns out that I loved it. Yes. It was a great fit. Um, I've, uh, I've enjoyed it, and mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, I don't regret staying there at all. So. How about the employees? What is the, the average of the turnover rate? Mm -hmm. Oh, our turnover rate is really... Um, um, relatively small mm -hmm. um, and our, you know, for people in the first year or so with the company um, obviously have a much higher turnover rate there it might be uh, it might be uh, uh, close to 20 percent or something like that but as we get up uh, uh, people who've been there for uh, a number of years it gets down five percent or below mm -hmm. yes. five yeah. percent so it's really very yes. small yes. once we uh, small. Once we get there, I mean, the uh, we, we have people, we, we sort of, we don't have very small differences in grades. We have broad bands. So mm -hmm. we have six broad bands we have people in, and band one is the first band, and then band five and six is our senior bands. And I, uh, geez, it's about 18 months or so ago that I looked at the turnover statistics for this, but for band six, I think it was about 1% per year, or something mm -hmm. like that. And so. Do you, do, I mean, in, in Watson Wyatt, do you have any special age for retirement or something? No. No, we have no mandatory retirement age. In fact, uh, we, it, it, it would be, it, it's not even legal to do that in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, unless for, um, yeah, unless you're in a very senior position. Mm -hmm. they, they could have a mandatory retirement age for me. Yeah. But we can't for employees generally. No. Uh, they uh, they passed that law several uh, you know uh, I don't know but a, a long number of years ago and so mm. and actually it's a law that ended up helping businesses because what happened is in the past businesses used to have a, a retirement age and they would just say people have to go then and they would just you know they'd say well you know, maybe as people get older they can't do the job and they just put in an age and they get rid of people. Mm. When you couldn't do that any longer, then what we have to do is go out and assess each individual. Are they doing the right job? So we do performance management, and the ones that are doing a good job, we keep, and the ones that aren't, we say you have to move on. Mm -hmm. But it's um, not having a mandatory retirement age is actually very good. Okay. Still, it is mandatory in Korea, right? Some yeah, companies, yes. Yeah, right? Yes, companies. Some flexible. Yeah. The, 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 the real problem is there are so many people too who want to work right now in Korea, but still we have not so many opportunities for recruiting them, especially for young people, because, because of the rigid workforce, some yeah. seniors do not want to go out. So fathers or daddies take the, their boys' job. That is the the mm -hmm. picture of the Korean industries in mm -hmm. some that of the Korean current situation. That's uh, mm -hmm. so for me. For me, it is not easy to 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 make understand the issue of the global talent, the development to to those managers because you have the surplus right now. Yes. Yeah. So that's the problem. More comment on. Okay. Do you have any other things to comment? No, this has been fun. Yes. <laughs> I this. Uh, you, you, you yourself is uh, actual? Actually, 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 yes. actually, I cannot remember that, that yes. kind of that terminology because we, we, we have a few actuaries in Korea, right? Yes. Just, just, just ten? Within, within five yeah. years. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm an actuary by yeah. background. I haven't done actuarial work for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so you are, you are very, very easy or comfortable with numbers, right? Oh, yes. Yeah, we're comfortable with numbers. <laughs> 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 oh, <okay. laughs> 
that's yeah. This is those kind of contradictive uh, con contradictionary images from you oh, as an actual yeah, yeah. and accuracy and but uh, very flexible. Oh, so right. you, as, a, as a as a the CEO and CEO of the Watson White HR Consulting Company, you 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 look to me very. Uh, yeah. Com the flexible, open-minded, but mm -hmm. as an actuary, <laughs> you are very good and very sensitive to numbers, right? Yes, yes. Mm. Um, and it's uh, it, it's interesting in my in my career as a as a consulting actuary. Mm. I think consulting actuaries have a different orientation mm -hmm. than maybe actuaries who are working inside an insurance company, which mm -hmm. I used to do, so yes. I have some mm -hmm. knowledge of how they work. When you're consulting, it's not enough to just go and figure out the numbers. Mm -hmm. Then you have to go and explain it to clients. Mm -hmm. So you have to take technical things and you have to explain them in non-technical fashion. Mm -hmm. And then you have to help them solve problems with it. Yeah. So you start to learn to be flexible and to think about it. Yeah. And this is my last question. And, uh, and for, for Watson White Company, uh, I, 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 I meet so many CEOs in, of Korea, but they are, I don't think they are very demanding. They, 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 demand, they little demands of the HL consulting services because they 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 want to uh, enlarge their market share or they want to go to China I mean the, the priorities that the marketing or sales mm -hmm. not developing their own employees yeah. so a, as the CEO and chairman of the Western Wise company what can be your advice to uh, I mean the exploitation of the the correlation of the employees' talent to our mobi the, the motivation and companies. Is yeah, yeah. We've we've done some work on this, and um, we've we we've did a large research project a number of years ago to look at um, specific human capital practices that mm -hmm. companies had. And what we said was, you know, there, there was like these awards, a like best company to work for, or something like that. And we said, so what? Mm -hmm. you, know, you might get an award, but if that doesn't, if that doesn't help you become a better business, who mm -hmm. really cares? So what we did was say, we want to measure and see, does human resource practices help mm -hmm. or not? And uh, we went through and did this big project where we uh, constructed what we called the Human Capital Index. And it said, okay, let's measure how companies do this and let's see how it works. And um, we worked with a, uh, we had a professor from Stanford come in and review our methodology to make sure it worked and everything, uh, Jeffrey Pfeiffer, who's one of the uh, uh, professors at the business school there. And we found that, in fact, um, it made a big difference. Mm. And that the companies that did the right kinds of things in terms of human resources, um, that, was a, that was correlated with a, um, an increase in market value. And we, we, we measured total returns to shareholders. We, we did mm. something more sophisticated uh, as an economic analysis with something called Tobin's Q. Yeah. Tobin's um, Q. And uh, we, we, we did that. But then we also measured it in terms of total returns to shareholders. And we found that total returns to shareholders went up uh, for companies with good human capital practices. Interestingly enough, a one standard deviation change in how you scored on the human capital index was um, about the same value added as having a superior research and development facility. Mm. So it's something that is not just insignificant. It was about a 20% increase in market value that you could get out of that. Mm. So I think, um, and, and we see, when I first started in this business back in the, in the late 1970s, um, it was called the personnel department as much mm -hmm. then before yes. it was really called mm -hmm. human resources. And it was seen as, um, as a cost base, as overhead. Yes. And I think the differences that I've seen in the U.S. and in a lot of other countries in that time is that now it's seen as part of the strategy. 
and it's seen as part of this human capital index as a way to add value and to get competitive advantage. Um, and GE is one of the leaders in terms of doing this, but the guy who is the head of human resources at GE is one of the top decision makers in the, com in the company. The same thing with IBM. The guy yeah. who is the senior vice president for human resources now is about one of the top five executives at IBM. So I think that uh, companies have moved towards this, and the ones that have done it have been the most successful. Mm -hmm. So what I would say is look to what the uh, successful companies have done. Yeah. So you have many, many cases and many oh, yeah. programs mm -hmm. to yep. deliver to those kinds of companies. Yep. Yeah, Mr. Haley, thank you for your time. Well, thank you. This was a real pleasure. I enjoyed talking with you. Yes.